on behalf of Northern Illinois University's STEM Read and the University Libraries, welcome to Future Telling. I'm Fred Barnhart and I have the privilege of being Dean of the NIU Libraries. I'm so excited to bring you tonight's conversation. This is your brain on sci-fi with our guests, neuroscientist Bobby Castori, author M.T. Anderson, and Dean of NIU's College of Visual and Performing Arts, Paul Castle. Many of you may not know this, but the NIU Libraries is one of the few rare books collections which actually specializes in collecting science fiction. Together with Jillian King Carlisle and Sarah Finnegan of NIU STEM Read, we drafted and brainstormed this idea for a program that celebrates the connections that happen when science fiction and science get together. We suspect that most scientists are either secretly or openly science fiction fans and were inspired by science fiction at some young age and also that most science fiction fans have a more than passing interest in the science that populates their favorite stories. By putting scientists together with creators in the same program, we hope to add fuel to the fires of innovation and inspire our audience to be creative, whether as scientists or authors or both. Now more than ever, we need to be creative and imaginative and pro-science. We hope that these conversations will help spur change and bring about a brighter future. We would like to thank the friends of the NIU Libraries and NIU STEAM for their support. We'd also like to thank the Division of Outreach, Engagement, and Regional Development and the Division of Research and Innovation Partnerships, both at NIU, for their commitment to community programming. If you're interested in supporting future telling, please go to the go.niu.edu forward slash give future telling site and make a donation of any size you're comfortable with. Tonight's conversation is all about the brain. We'll be thinking about thinking, exploring the nature and neurology of creativity, and learning about the amazingly complex nature of the human brain. We'll talk about the hopes, dreams, and anxieties over artificial intelligence, and we'll do this with three amazing thinkers who are all in their own way exploring the same question, what is it that makes us human? Our first guest is Dean Paul Castle, who will join Jillian King Cargyle in a pre-recorded discussion. After that, Jillian will join Bobby Castori and M.T. Anderson for a live conversation in a Q&A session. Uh, the event will be recorded and posted on the Future Telling website, so we encourage you to share it afterwards with others as well. So without further ado, here's our interview with Paul Castle, and thank you again for joining us. So I'm Paul Castle. I'm the Dean of the College of Visual and Performing Arts here at Northern Illinois University. I'm a theater artist by trade and I worked in a profession for about a dozen years or so and then made my way into academia when I found myself less than fully satisfied with uh, my uh, career. I was in a show for a long run and I found out I didn't really like doing that. And uh, that was kind of a surprise. So I started investigating um, different things and I found myself uh, uh, in a summer theater program where I fell in love with teaching and uh, that became my life's work and I've been doing that now for almost uh, 30 years, about 27 years since I joined the ranks of teachers. Believe it or not, when I was a freshman in college at Miami of Ohio, part of the MAC, as just like NIU, I initially was a physics major because I love theoretical physics and I had a teacher who just really excited my mind and my imagination about the idea when I heard about how Einstein uh, imagined himself traveling on a photon uh, that seemed like the coolest thing ever and I was a big science fiction nut all growing up loved Star Trek and all the nerdy things that kids my you know in my generation did and um, so I was a physics major but I soon found out that calculus and I were not made for each other um, but but also um, Within a couple of days, I also knew that theater is where I really belong. And in the intervening years, I thought about what what is that relationship? What are the things? What are the commonalities? And there actually is one. Physics is about the play of energy at the subatomic level and perhaps at the galactic level. But theater is about the play of energy at the human level. And from there, uh, I discovered some philosophers and some thinkers that expanded my notion beyond theater into all art forms. And all art forms, art and science, are like two sides of the same coin, the Apollonian and the Dionysian. You know, um, the idea there, it sounds very Greek, and it is, um, the idea there is that um, we both experiment, both the scientists and the artists experiment with form. But I would say the disposition of the scientists is generally um, more skeptical. You know, we have a hypothesis and we try to, in some ways, to disprove it. Whereas the, and there, the scientist asked why, 
But the artist says, why not? And we are not restrained by the laws of physics and through our imagination. But I find those two things very, very closely allied. And, the, the, and creativity is a necessary ingredient for both the scientist and the artist, and really for all human beings. And the idea that somehow we're, we have to be a specialist, either a scientist or an artist, to be imaginative or creative is just hooey. I love this idea of the play between um, energy and humans. So that's, you know, the, the connections between physics and theater. So do you want to talk a little bit more about how you've investigated that and the idea of how the brain plays into um, acting and responses to acting and art? Yes, absolutely. So it's interesting how my journey as a, as a theater artist led me from what are the building blocks of, a, of an actor? And then to understand those building blocks, I had to begin to learn about how the brain worked and neuroscience and evolutionary studies. So that's really the nexus of my own research. So it began with a problem in the classroom. Acting is doing. Aristotle said that, this famous Stanislavski, you know, acting is doing something in a, inside a pretend. You know, we uh, so we pretend we have some sort of relationship, and but in in the creation of that relationship in the audience, is we have to play actions. But I was never clear what that meant. But what playing is an alignment of energy, an organization of energy. And what I discovered in the classroom in trying to communicate it was those the they boil down to four basic energies: push, pull, hold, release. And it turns out those are the first four volitional actions that every infant does from sucking when you nurse and suck that's a pull when you eliminate waste that's a push when you grasp the finger that's a hold and then the cessation of all those activities is a release so those for me were the building blocks and this isn't a completely original idea i've sort of built on the work of stanislavski this guy michael chekhov etc cetera, etc cetera. but then i started thinking well what's happening here in the brain and physiologically that manifests itself as those energies. We, we observe them and we say, that person's pushing and we can feel it. Even pre-push, we can feel the intention. And it turns out in the brain, supposedly, this is contested to some degree, we have a thing called mirror neurons. There are a set of um, neurons that um, activate in the brain when we do things, but they mirror someone else's intention. So the classic example is grasping a cup. So when I do this, there's supposedly motor neurons in your brain that reflect, that mirror that, so you can grasp the intention. Now, why would, would that be a handy thing from an evolutionary point of view? If I raise my hand like this, you have to determine threat or opportunity. And so by detecting intention at a pre-conscious level, you can decide whether to withdraw or approach. This could be high, but it also could be I oughta. And so you have to make the instantaneous evaluation. The fact is science has, neuroscience has shown us that we are activating behaviors prior to our awareness of that activation. That's, I know for true. The mirror neuron is a more contested idea, but from a theater point of view, I love that idea because in fact, that's what audiences do. When we talk about audience being moved, what we're talking about is when actors play actions, push, pull, hold, release, that that intention is clear to an audience and their mirror neurons supposedly react to a mirror that thing and they're literally moved. Now we see this in macaque monkeys, it's proven in there, whether that retains from an evolutionary point from the primate to humans is contested. I know the neuroscientist on this might, I've had a neuroscientist yell at me about this because that was some years ago. Um, and I'm not claiming to, to know that this is for sure. What I do know is that um, people play actions and that people can detect actions. And that so much um, of what we do is, in, is detection of intention. And that's a really important thing. So I sort of went down a rabbit hole of neuroscience and that expanded to the nature of consciousness itself because these are where all these questions lead. And what does it mean to be a subject a subject, I, what does it mean to be me? And and how do I activate this? And how do I know I'm activating it? And so it's really kind of a fascinating journey that we really can't solve because in order to do so, we don't have the, the equipment 
we there, there are people uh, experiments where people have been shoved in fMRI, you know, the magnetic resonant imaging, and they look at pictures or they listen to music, and we see the activity in their brains, but it's very murky and very primitive, and we can't definitively say. Um, if I shoved an actor in and said, push, organize your energy into a push, which you can do, will there be a signature in the brain that shows that definitively? Probably not, because it's it's specific to the individual, it's contextual, and we did, our equipment just isn't sophisticated enough to be able to, you know, locate that. It's like we can't locate consciousness. You know, I'm talking, and we could scan my brain as I'm talking, but that doesn't mean it's me. Bobby Castori is one of our guests tonight. He is a uh, Hi, Bobby. neuroscientist. <laughs> Don't yell at me. Don't yell at me. I didn't mean it. Um, so what questions would you have for him? He is making one of the most complete maps of the brain uh, ever. I would be interested if we can read um, intentional signatures in the brain. When someone gets in your face, you know, and you're holding in, you're, you're holding yourself back from some sort of reaction, either fight, flee, or, you know, fight or flee, approach or withdraw. Is there a physiological fingerprint or on the brain that we could say that's a push or that's a pull or that's a hold? Now, we know that motor activity occurs, but does it have a signature? That I'd be interested in. And then could I use biofeedback to help fine tune my that organization of energy so we know with practice we can get better at behaviors that over time we get more efficient in our use of energy and um it becomes almost second nature whether you're a baseball player a wrestler or an actor singer dancer or an ice skater you're you're not you're no longer thinking these things it's happening because you practice so much could we improve practice by using biofeedback in order to organize our energy so we know where we're going wrong. So, for example, golfers get them their um, videoed and they see what they're doing mechanically wrong. But that's on the outside. What's happening on the inside that isn't properly organized that creates problems in behavior? Then could we go from there and program artificial intelligence with those same kind of signatures? What do you think the ramifications would be for art and for theater uh, or literature if you could um, program an AI to uh, create those pushes and pulls that you've been talking about? Well, I think people get crazy somewhat about these things and they're like, robots are going to take over. They're not, but what, but we're going to be, uh, we can use it in an alliance. I believe that AI can, and I'm actually more a fan of um, uh, assisted reality or what augmented reality. I think that could be a really cool art form. Imagine either with the visor or however we could, whatever the future brings us in terms of that. And we interact with spectral figures as well as corporeal figures. Now, should we reconstruct Humphrey Bogart and put him in a new movie? I have ethical problems with that, though I think eventually that will, it's already being done. Uh, people are reconstructing, you know, those are digital imagery, but then it's not a short step to capturing my behavior like Andy Circus as Gollum. You know, that's the direction I think we're heading. We're already doing that in film. Can we do that in live performances? Can we create a, a connection with the audience through interfaces or uh, augmented reality or even VR to create enhance that experience? You know, so for example, in Macbeth, we see ghosts. If I'm, if I'm an audience member and I have an augmented reality, maybe those ghosts appear in a, in a different way, in a, in a virtual reality that suddenly becomes a much more immersive experience for the audience. Um, and I think we're seeing theater and, and movies, cinema, approach each other in really interesting ways. We will never, ever recreate the, the sense of corporeal presence except with human beings. I just don't think that that's replicable. Right now, the connection between you and me is, is cold. There's no way past it. But the, if you were in front of me, it would warm up just like that there will always be a coldness in AI, no matter how good it gets. I, you know, maybe I'm wrong about that. I just don't believe in a Blade, Blade Runner future. I don't think that's a long way away. <laughs> Not something that you're worried about. No, no, no. And you know, I mean, we're talking, human beings have, are limited and we may be surpassed. We are already surpassed by Watson and other, you know, computing things. 
whether it's Jeopardy or chess or Go, you know, the Chinese game Go. Um, so we should not be fearful of our limitations being exceeded. Um, that doesn't actually mean that we're on our way out as a species. That's a different question. Um, <laughs> anyway, so I'm not really afraid of technology. Um, what I'm afraid of is the fear of technology pre um, preventing wise decision making. But as long as we're out loud and thoughtful about it and the right people are thinking about it, enough people are thinking about it, a diverse group of people are thinking about it, then I think there's some hope because it's going to happen. People tend to do stuff. They can't help themselves. And we've uh, talked before and you've said that science is losing the hearts and minds of people. How do we work with scientists and researchers to more fully articulate um, their work and work in a way that a variety of stakeholders can understand? So one of the things I'm interested to do here at NIU, and I've talked to our VP for research, is a center for data studies in which we collect data, we analyze data, but then we communicate data. And that's where my college comes in, through data visualization, but the data oralization, how we hear data, but also drama, uh, data dramatization, how we perform data. And I think all those things come together to help communicate information in science, but it boils down to the human connection. You know, and again, it, and it goes back to the beginning of our conversation. Is our culture supporting the creative imagination? When I, when college freshmen come into my acting classroom, the first six weeks at least are sort of imaginative, imagination triage. I have to help help them reconnect with their childhood and their child behave, childlike behavior, where they invent and play. And um, our culture doesn't really privilege play. But every scientist is a play, plays around. And, and, and the same with uh, the artists. They play around with stuff to make something new. And that's my mission as an artist and as an educator and as a dean is to try to prompt that, to try to say yes. It's based on improv, which is say yes. I love what you're saying about saying yes and also about that idea of fostering creativity uh, throughout your life. Uh, and it sounds like that's something that you're working on. So um, let's talk about that. Right. So creating is to is doing, but in a particular fashion. Creativity creativity describes a mode of action as opposed to mechanically or instinctually. So when you see I'm creative, oh he's so creative. What we're describing a kind of doing rather than I'm mechanically. He's eating mechanically, or he's behaving instinctually. Right. He's behaving creatively, and I'm actually doing it right now, you know. Um, so it's not fantasy, um, which is imagination unconnected to boundaries of physics. And it's not just imagination, which is predictive, but not necessarily active. I imagine things, but I may not act on that, right? Um, but being creative more properly is uh, those we describe as creative. Um, it's not a state of being um, or property being. It's something we do, and that's what I think people get messed up on. Oh, he's so creative. That's a judgment or a label that we put on people. But creativity is, a, is like I said, a mode of action. So creativity is an act of transforming this to that via the ability to conceive in a form, which is what I call talent. Talent is the ability to conceive in a form. It could, the form could be baseball, the form could be acting, the form could be painting. But it's not enough to have just good ideas because that's fantasy. Creativity requires an additional thing, determination, a stick to itiveness, a profound urge to complete. So I don't know if you ever, did you remember, do you remember seeing Close Encounters of the Third Kind? Have you ever seen that movie? So Richard Dreyfuss gets obsessed, right? He's an image in his mind of this thing. And he's sitting at the dinner table and he starts playing with his mashed potatoes and he builds up what turns out to be that mountain, right? And his, his kids and his wife look at him like, you're messed up what's wrong with you but he can't help himself he's driven to realize what he imagines and that's what really marcates demarcates creativity that's i don't know have a good word for it it's probably a german word you know some gigantic portmanteau where you you build up this thing where a stick to itiveness where i have to finish this thing that I feel inside of me. And later, you know, Dreyfus fills up his whole apartment with mud to recreate this thing, to get it right. And to me, that is the perfect metaphor for the creative person. And whether it's a scientist, a relentless drive to discover, 
and to find and to, to get that, th that answer. There's an urgency to it. So sum up, creativity is an act of transformation arising from a conception within a form driven by an urge to complete. Well, I, I like that idea. And I think that's one of the things that really um, can define you as a successful artist or scientist or writer, certainly, is that you have that drive, but you also have that stick to to be able to see your ideas through. If you can't muster the uh, stick to it it doesn't matter how, how great your ideas are. If right. You can't communicate them. And what I like about there. the definition, exactly. And what I like about the definition is each step gives you a way to train and help and prompt. From that definition, we can learn how to teach creativity more effectively. Otherwise, it's just you got it or you don't. And I just don't believe that. It's like talent. Everybody can do everything that any other human being can do. It That is, to me, a natural law of the universe. And that's what gives me hope. You know, at the end of the day, that people find a way, scientists, artists, teachers, they find their way. And we need that kind of hope now more than ever. And welcome to the second half of Future Telling, where we will be talking to Bobby Castori and M.T. Anderson. I'm Jillian King Cargyle. I'm the director of NIU STEM Read. And I'm so excited to have Bobby and Tobin here with us today. Um, Bobby is going to start us out by introducing his research and telling us more about uh, his research question. Thanks for being here, Bobby. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, and thank you all for, for, for coming to this event. I, like was mentioned, am one of those scientists who is not at all hidden uh, about how much of a sci-fi geek I am. I remain a lot lifelong fan of science fiction and it is likely, in fact, I know it is one of the reasons that I'm here today to talk to you about my research. I'm a, a assistant professor in the Department of Neurobiology at the University of Chicago, uh, and I'm a neuroscience researcher at Argonne uh, National Labs, perhaps the first ever empirical neuroscientist hired at a national lab, uh, university, uh, uh, national lab organization. And I usually use this moment to tell everybody which makes me, of course, the best neuroscientist at uh, uh, Argonne National Labs. And the first time I told that joke, my daughter said, uh, yeah, but doesn't that also make you the worst neuroscientist at Argonne National Labs? <laughs> so I'll let you guys decide uh, uh, after this. What I'll be talking about uh, on the next slide, uh, um, we heard a little bit about already, uh, is uh, uh, the brain, specifically the human brain. Something that I've been interested in for a, a, a really long time, of course, everyone is uh, uh, interested in. Uh, but I was particularly interested in it uh, starting medical school. I have a sort of family history of psychiatric illness, and I was really interested in medical school to understand a little bit more about how psychiatric illness works. And although I found that uh, uh, the neurologists and the psychologists and the psychiatrists, the people who worked on the brain in the hospital, are some of the smartest people I've ever met. The therapies, and I think, you know, to this day, are still the wild, wild west. We don't really understand mental illness in a way where we could then treat it. Uh, uh, and I realized that if I wanted to kind of make a contribution, a real contribution would be to really better understand the physical basis of mental illness. And, and I soon figured, uh, I learned that we didn't understand that. So I, I thought maybe the first point would be to understand the physical basis of the brain, uh, which is something that I've been now trying to do I guess now for the last 12 years so since medical school. Uh, and I thought I'd talk to you a little bit about what the work is that we do, and more importantly, where I think it fits into what might happen in the future, a lot of things that we heard about in that video. So just so that we're all on the same page, I just thought I'd spend one minute showing you a very famous picture of a brain, uh, actually specifically things in a brain. This is a picture taken by a famous neuroscientist, Santiago Ramon y Cajal, in the early 20th century. And what's interesting about Cajal in this picture is it's probably one of the very first pictures of a brain seen under a compound microscope with optics and uh, uh, et cetera. And Cajal used a very special stain here, which allowed him to look at brain cells for the very first time. And, and in this example, there's about four brain cells here labeled G, A, C, and one that's unlabeled. These are called neurons. And Cajal was the first person to discover that there are neurons there. 
And he discovered two other things which are in this picture. I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. The first is that neurons don't look the same. They look different uh, uh, from different angles. The top of the neuron in A, for example, looks different than the bottom of the neuron. Cajal called this the law of polarization. And it means that there are parts of neurons. You might see the part that's sticking up that looks like a tree. We call that the dendrite or the dendritic tree. And you might see the part that sticks down very south. It looks like a little wire. And we call that the axon. So up till now, when I tell the story, I think, you know, uh, I could have done this if I was the first person to, uh, to like Cajal. But there's something in this picture that I think is truly sort of genius. Normally, I'd ask people to guess, but since we don't have that kind of time, I'll tell you what it is. Uh, it's the arrows. Uh, there are no arrows in the brain, unfortunately. And what Cajal was telling us in 1903 is how information flows in the nervous system. It flows up the axon, for example, of F. It flows into the dendrites of neuron A. It flows out of neuron A and on to neuron G, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And what's a deep and kind of, I think, disturbing insight we've had ever since then is that that's all brains are. They're just collections of neurons that pass information back and forth to each other. Uh, and that if you understood that network of connections, how one connects, how A connects to B, then you would understand a lot of things that brains do, which is what I'm interested in. Unfortunately, and, and, and I'm going to actually tell you specifically, the very specific reason why I'm interested in this, and, uh, and, and it's because of this. Uh, even before I was interested in neuroscience, I was fundamentally interested in this idea, which is how do brains grow up? Uh, and here I have three pictures of uh, uh, two children at, at various ages. You probably don't recognize them uh, uh, now. Uh, uh, ultimately, these children turn into uh, 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 Jane Goodall, Mahatma Gandhi and Albert Einstein. These are their baby pictures, if you will. Uh, and and uh, I, I like, first I like this because you could tell even when Jane was a little, little girl, she just loved animals. Uh, uh, but the argument I like to make is I, I, at, none, at no point now as, the, uh, as babies did any of the three of them realize that they were going to grow up into Jane Goodall, Gandhi, or Albert Einstein. And it's probably unlikely uh, that the, the things that made them what they were have anything to do with what was in their genetics or, 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 or what was in their specific sequences of DNA. And actually much more likely is it's what they learned. It's what they learned growing up that turned them into the people uh, 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 that they are. And, and, and even more incredibly, we have a theory of how this works. It turns out that the main, we think, way that humans grow up and humans learn is that the connections between the neurons, just like Cajal had discovered, change. And that's it. So if you understood perhaps what the connection patterns look like in a child and in an adult and how they change, you would understand how humans learn. And I hope we get into this discussion later on. I think this is the fundamentally the thing that makes us human, that we spend so much of our time developing, that our brains are slow, so, to, so slow to develop uh, um, uh, that it makes us almost uh, uh, unique among the animals. So why haven't we done this already? Why haven't neuroscientists already accomplished? Well, because it turns out that in your brain and in all human brains, there's something like a hundred billion uh, uh, neurons, and each of them make on order 10,000 connections with each other. So in your brain and the human brain, there's something like a quadrillion connections between neurons. And, and a quadrillion is a, a hard number uh, 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 for me to understand, but one way to, to, to perhaps imagine it uh, is that it's about 10 to 100 times more than there are stars in the Milky Way galaxy. So there's essentially 10 galaxies worth of neuronal connections, if you will, inside uh, your brain. And, and it makes the finest web uh, uh, that we've ever seen. And in fact, I've spent most of my very long postdoc career, and now as a professor, figuring out ways to map out every neuron and every connection. Uh, it, uh, it, and I might want to show you just for a few minutes before I end, is what an extremely small piece of a mouse brain, which is an extremely small version of a human brain, how complicated it could be. So if, you could, if we could play the movie here, I'll show you a three-dimensional kind of reconstruction of a, literally a grain of sand uh, 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 of, of a mouse brain that, that you're going to see in eight, nine. So what, this is, a, 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 again, a, a, a piece of a mouse brain that's smaller than a grain of sand. And what we did was we tried to trace out how every neuron, every wire in it looked. And I have to explode it for you so you can see how complicated it is. 
So it turns out that even in this tiny, tiny little piece, uh, uh, the size of a grain of sand, there are thousands and thousands of wires uh, from thousands and thousands of different neurons. They seem to have this complicated spaghetti-like structure, but it's important to remember that this works again and again and again from mouse to mouse to mouse, and to mostly from human to human uh, 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 to human. And so really what, what I'm interested in is understanding how that works, how it's possible to make those rules. Uh, 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 how to understand those rules. And I think, I think we're good for this now. I wonder if I can just go back to my presentation. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, we can talk a little bit more about what it took to, to get that. I just want to leave you with what we hope to accomplish. The first thing that's important to say is that if we could map all the connections in a human brain, it would be this new amount of data that has probably never really been explored before. It's this idea of a zettabyte. Uh, uh, and so let me tell you what that is. It, 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 you might know of a gigabyte. Uh, uh, that's probably a couple of gigabytes of what it takes to store a Hollywood movie. Uh, 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 on your computer. A zettabyte, I think, is on order. I can make sure this is true. A trillion gigabytes. Uh, uh, something like, uh, you know, almost a hundred billion Hollywood movies, uh, stacked end to end. It would be the most amount of data ever collected about any particular thing in the history, uh, uh, of the world. So another way to think about it is if you took all the material in the Library of Congress, all the video, the audio, if you will, to some first approximation, all the knowledge that humans have collected up till now, it would be, I think, about 0.1% of the data set that we'd like to uh, uh, collect. And the reason we'd like to collect it, I'd just like to tell you in the last couple of slides, is that the hard hypothesis, the really uh, you know, uh, strict hypothesis in neuroscience, is that every little piece about you, everything about you, is stored in that map of connection. So every memory that you've ever had, all your skills, your motivations, your fears, your hopes, your desires. So if we had that wiring diagram, and we could talk about how we would read that wiring diagram, we would understand almost all of this uh, uh, about you. And we would see how that wiring diagram differed from person to person and how it reflected these uh, 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 values. Like I said, there are lots of now diseases like schizophrenia, like autism, uh, perhaps even things like depression. Where we think these are not just you know uh, genetic differences in, in people, but actually failures of neurons to connect appropriately, uh, particularly in interesting ways like uh, 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 in interesting ways that might cause you know a memory in one person uh, a different variation or miswiring might call it to pathology in, in somebody else. The last thing I'm very interested in is how how much can we take what we know about human beings and put them into robots and computers. And one of the things that I'm particularly interested in, uh, and we heard a little bit about this, it turns out that computers can now beat us in chess, they can beat us in Go, uh, apparently they can now beat us in poker, which stresses me out because it seems they understand perception perhaps uh, uh, better than we do. But, but I'll tell you one thing that's true uh, of all of those algorithms, and actually of any algorithm that we hear about, all of them operate at energy levels that dwarf uh, what the human brain operates. So all, as far as we can tell, all human brains operate at about 20 watts. Uh, 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 that's how much energy over time a, a brain takes. In the rooms that you're sitting in, the light bulbs where you are, those are about 60 watts uh, 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 of energy. Uh, I work at Argonne uh, uh, National Lab where we have, the, I think, the fourth or the third largest supercomputer in the world. And the next generation and the generation after that are going to require their own power plants to, 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 to power them. Uh, uh, and, and hopefully at that point, they can do things that human brains can do. But none of them can do it at the energy efficiency uh, 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 that we have. As somebody who works at the DOE in the DOE labs, I know that in five years, 10 years, the, huge, the biggest part of our energy budget is not going to be the oil that we put in our cars or our planes. But it's this constant stream of images and movies and pictures that we're uploading and downloading to the internet, somehow brains have discovered how to do that uh, uh, at almost uh, no cost. Uh, I probably would have run over. I always have a tempted to, uh, but I, I thought I would just leave you with one last quote and, uh, and one last point. And actually, the main reason 
that I do this. Uh, um, and I do this, and I know some of you are thinking, God, this is a pretty crazy idea to try to collect more data than has ever been collected in the history of, of the world. And you know, I agree. <laughs> I think it's a crazy idea. Uh, but when I think about how crazy it is, I, I think about this quote. This is a quote that uh, President Kennedy gave at Rice University in 19, around 1962, where he announces that we go to the moon. And I'm just going to read this uh, uh, together, just because uh, you know, it's interesting to see how presidents used to talk. So I thought it would be worth that we could uh, uh, read it together. So we choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they're easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal serves to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we are willing to accept, unwilling to postpone, and one which we intend to win. But why some say the moon, or I hear the brain, uh, why choose this as our goal? And they may well ask, well, why climb the highest mountain? Why 35 years ago fly the Atlantic? Why does Rice uh, play Texas? I, I think he means in football. Um, and I, I'll, I'll end with this. You know, seven years later, when we land, uh, on the moon in 1969. The average age of a NASA scientist is uh, 28 years old. Uh, uh, and I don't know what the average age of a NASA scientist is now, but I tell, I'm sure it's older than 28. I think it might be in its 50s or, or, or 60s. So if the average age was uh, 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 28, that means in 1962, uh, these were college students or uh, uh, high school students. And, and they became inspired by this idea of doing something bigger uh, uh, than that, which is what the kind of ideas that I get from uh, sci-fi. And it started a huge generation of people interested in space and furthered a whole bunch of other technologies that probably still haven't been quantified to this day. So that's why I'm interested in, in, in these projects, not just to understand how the brain works, because maybe we'll get there, maybe we won't. Uh, uh, but I think the key will be to inspire another generation of people to be interested in it. That's what we hope to do with our science, and that's what I see uh, from science fiction. I, I thank you all for listening. I'm really looking forward to the discussion. Well, thank you, Bobby. Yeah, we're really excited to listen to more and to hear how your thoughts and M.T. Anderson's thoughts will uh, either converge or diverge on this uh, type of research. So we'll invite uh, Tobin into the room as well. I, I think, Bobby, if you want to stay, um, too, we'll, we'll bring Bobby back. And Tobin, I'd like to have you also introduce yourself and tell us about your work. Hey, so um, can you hear me, first of all? Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, great. So, hey, um, so I'm um, M.T. Anderson, Tobin Anderson, and I am, um, I guess uh, I stand out to some extent in this crowd in that um, when I'm going to talk about this, I uh, my leaning in my writing is much more towards the sort of the, the humanities um, part of all of this. In a, in a sense, I'm interested in the way that science gets altered by the society we live in because it can mean totally different things. And so I think that it's appropriate that therefore I'm sitting here uh, coming to you from like a uh, an 18th century uh, haunted house in the middle of the mountains of Vermont. Um, because, uh, you know, I, uh, I feel like, I feel sometimes like an 18th century haunted house um, in the world that I live in. Um, so for me, one of the interesting things is that all the stuff that Bobby is looking into, um, I have written about sort of imaginatively over time. Um, and um, as uh, Paul said in that first segment, you know, to some extent, um, creators, uh, who are like artists have some freedom because we don't actually have to prove any axiom. We can just make up something that's true. Um, and wham, there it is. Um, that allows us to play with things like symbolically and that kind of thing. And so in my writing, when I've written about technologies of the kind that, um, that Bobby's mapping might eventually end us with, that is to say, for example, human um, computer interfaces or AI that can replicate uh, human behaviors and human learning and, and perhaps even consciousness, all that kind of thing. Obviously, um, it's much easier for the author of uh, science fiction to do that than for the, um, for the engineer or the neuroscientist. So, um, so the first, the, the book which, um, which 
Uh, I suspected the reason Jillian asked me to be here with Bobby is called Feed. Um, and it is a book, just to give you a couple of sentences, it's about a world in which everyone has a bit of an internet um, connection right in their heads, which is great in terms of our ability to siphon through information and that kind of thing. But in fact, as a result, oddly enough, the population of the United States has become tremendously uh, stupid because they are also having their thoughts constantly flooded with this, you know, this flood of advertisements. So advertisements, but also, you know, their dreams are being um, are being mined for uh, for data. They're um, to build up, you know, uh, profiles of them, um, and uh, and there's just this sort of constant flurry of of uh, distracting activity. And, that kind of thing. Um, and I do worry about that. I think that the thing about Technologies, like when I talk to um, teens about this book in schools and that kind of thing, they always say, you know, do you want that? Do you want the chip in your head? And many of them do. They, you know, they completely do. They're like, well, yeah, we can, we can kind of text each other without using our thumbs or having anyone else see. We, you know, I, I always tell them, you know, if you like the shirt, someone else in the room, you can instantly purchase it without typing in any, uh, you know, um, credit card numbers. Um, and, um, one second, I'm so sorry, but I'm gonna to have to just shut the door because the dog appears to have found a coyote. One second, I'm not kidding, even <laughs> <laughs> the dog just wanted to be part of the show. Coyotes <laughs> do come out here at about this time, um, anyway. So, you know, my um, my sense is that um, that when we deal with new technologies and that kind of thing. One of the things that we always need to ask is who is paying for it? Who's paying for the research? Who's paying for it to be purchased? Who's paying for it to be used? Anytime you think that a platform is free, you are wrong. I mean, there is always someone who is profiting from it, except in a few cases of shareware. Um, otherwise, somehow, you are if you are not buying something from a service, you yourself are the product it is being sold. Um, that's one of the things to know about sort of modern sort of information technology. And we have to consider this um, in a sort of dystopian realm because it's happening right now. I mean, if you look at the way that, for example, um, China has weaponized social media, that kind of thing, you think that that seems ludicrous, but of course it actually can happen. Um, once this data is collected by someone, it is available for all sorts of people. If you have a brain, um, you know, I mean, uh, Paul talked about various entertaining versions of a, uh, of a, of a, of a brain computer interface. And yeah, absolutely. I would love to be able to see those incredible sort of Hollywood vistas with my own eyes, you know, having, having the visual cortex directly stimulated. So I see sort of like the bank of clouds, the castle, all this kind of thing. That would be great. But what does it mean if we are, if someone is able to read thought? What does that mean about who owns that data? You know, throughout all of human history, there has always been a place deep in the human uh, that has been inaccessible to others, where you can retreat. What does it mean if that is no longer there? What does it mean if, uh, for example, if you can play back memories? Um, I have a, I'm working on a story right now which um, won't be out for a couple of years, but um, in which, for example, people obviously, the first thing that would happen if you could record sensation is people would start, you know, uh, making porn films, porn sticks, porn sticks, you know, when like you, uh, you record the sex act and sell it to someone, right? Um, but I mean, the other hand, what about this? That also means that you can record yourself torturing someone, you can record the sensations of someone being tortured, and then you can replay them for someone else, as it were. You can torture others without leaving any wound upon them. That, that's also a possibility. We have to think, what are the potentialities of these things? In a sense, capitalism drives us forward to always um, to discover these new technologies. And yet, at the same time, um, and, and step by step, they always seem like a good idea. And it always seems grab if you do not have them. But on the other hand, then the question is, at some point, a, a complete change has been made in the way that the world works and 
as I'm sure that Bobby will. Even neurological wiring from something like our social media um, interaction, we are being neurologically rewired already. Even someone like me who grew up before the age of the internet, um, I now have a different kind of selection of uh, neural connections and dopamine releases based on, um, you know, liking crap on, on Facebook. Um, so um, another, just to, uh, to close out a sort of a set of, I don't know, challenges that I think are posed by this interaction of science and then the culture, and, and in particular science and the question of who pays for it and how does that then shape our world. So um, another um, book of mine is Landscape with Invisible Hand, um, which is, uh, the, its general topic is not as relevant in that it's about a, um, uh, it's about uh, a, a time in just a few years when the earth has become a third world backwater in an alien race's um, uh, economic empire. So we're sort of like a crappy co country where they sort of, you know, they extract our resources and that's it. Our economy has totally collapsed because they offered us their technology, but we didn't really think about the fact that it's behind a paywall. So the wealthy, you know, get all of this incredible crap. They, they can heal cancer. They have godlike abilities, but the rest of us don't because we can't really pay for it. And, um, and you know, I mean, uh, Paul uh, Castle was very sanguine about the, the prospect that, you know, there's no way that, that machines and AI can replace us or will replace us soon. But I would actually disagree. I mean, obviously, in the workplace, it is already happening. Even if we are thinking of those, even just through mechanical processes and that kind of thing, we live in a post-industrial society to some, because, both because of sort of reasons having to do with, you know, labor, uh, labor, labor um, decisions and also having to do with mechanization. And we are, and so in this world, um, in the world of this book, the earth is uh, like in an economic depression because of course, in a capitalist society, in order to earn enough to, uh, to eat, you have to labor. But what does it mean when there are devices that, that can do that labor for you? And so you start to ask questions about, well, so wait a second, what is the function of the human? Um, we always demand every other creature on this earth prove its use to us for us to uh, allow it to sort of continue in its, in its way is the use of us. And that's going to become more important if, um, and here's where we can maybe have some fisticuffs, Bobby. If, um, if you eventually have AI that, for example, you know, that as you're, most of your science fiction writers see a little bit of the singularity, if we do reach the point of the singularity, when, um, when AI can actually think faster than us, then suddenly there will be another learning presence on this earth, Art smart, smarter and faster than us, which also can ask that question, what are humans useful? And that answer is going to be very dangerous to us because we're used to being at the apex of the predatory so um, I guess that's, those are my questions in a sense, or the, the things that I like to think about are not simply the, the technologies themselves, because, you know, like Steve, I wrote this 20 years ago, and at the time, all of the technologies we're talking about were absolute fantasies. Um, they were like a science fiction joke to me. They progressed remarkably quickly. Um, but that's not always going to be the case. But, for me, therefore, the, the form of science fiction is not necessarily about the science, but is instead about, it's a way of, of dreaming symbolically. It's a way of symbolically understanding how could human life be different? How can we make the parameters different and understand how we would be? And you have to do that also when looking at real technology. You have to say to yourself, we have the intelligence to uh, perform some of these, some of these miraculous feats, become almost godlike, and yet at the same time, do we have a moral intelligence that actually keeps pace with that? 
do we have the ability to deal with these things ethically in a way that will not endanger? Um, so that, I guess, is my, uh, is my spiel. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm really I'm anxious to talk about it all. <laughs> First thing I'm going to tell my dog to shut up. OK. <laughs> hey, Larissa, <laughs> There, no problem. Um, yeah, I, I think that you know one of the roles of sci-fi has always been to hold that mirror up to society and you know check where we are and check our morals, check our ethics. So there is a lot of paranoia, I would say, around uh, AI, especially. Um, Bobby, how do you respond to that? Some of those, you know, those worst paranoid fears that that you hear as a as a researcher who's working in in that area. Yeah, I mean, I think I, it's first worth saying that I don't know very much about how to make AI. I mean, I take make take pictures of brains and, and try to think about how brains work. It turns out, unfortunately or fortunately, the two fields are mixing, and they're mixing closer uh, uh, than they ever did, I don't know, 30, even 10 years ago. The, the interface between neuroscience and AI wasn't as obvious. I, I would say, you know, some of those fears could be justified. <laughs> I, I'm not advocating. Uh, uh, when I try to look for hope uh, in this situation, or, or, or try to think about it hopefully, I think about two things. Uh, one. We make things smarter than us all the time, uh, our children, most of the time. Uh, 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 and yet they don't turn and around and kill us and question the value of us. Uh, uh, no, uh, wait, have you been teenagers the... yet? <laughs> My kids are not yet teenagers, so I don't know how to, how to, to, uh, to, answer, to answer that. But broadly they don't. Uh, and one reason is because we raise them. Uh, and we instill in them uh, uh, values and new ideas. I'm, I'm assuming, maybe just hopefully, that AI will also have to be raised. It's unlikely to, uh, if, if it's really going to be as general and as powerful, it, will, it won't emerge like a, uh, that goddess out of somebody's head. It's going to grow with us. Uh, it might grow faster because it's AI. That's a fair point. Uh, but at some point, it has to have a worldview. Uh, I think to, to even to do anything, to have a purpose, like uh, 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 they were saying in the video, you have to have a worldview. And that worldview comes with how you're raised. So there's a chance that a bunch of bad people could raise AI and come after us. But a bunch of bad people could raise children and do <laughs> all the time. I, I, anyway, I don't have a good answer. I think the fears are done. Well, that, like, so I think about, you know, um, there was that experiment, was like two years ago now, where, um, where Google tried to create an AI personality, um, essentially taught AI to, to act like someone on a on a chat room, which of course is a terrible idea because this is the worst people. So um, it just ended up that they produced something without trying. Purely algorithmically, they produced something that was like a racist troll, which um, and I think that that's kind of an interesting, you know, an interesting algorithmic model. What happens? You know, you think you're just letting it go free, you know, create a worldview, and what you end up with is is someone kind of uh, hideous and dangerous who lives in his mother's basement. Yeah, if I raised my my son who's in seventh grade, if I just raised him on chat rooms, probably same result, right? Like uh, uh, he would probably be a much worse adult. Uh, uh, so terrible. I agree, it was a terrible idea. I would assume people who do AI. We want to raise them and cultivate them in the same way that they would want their children, but this clearly wasn't that. It didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> so, what what do you want to see then? What is the what is the hopeful version of you know the implications of completely mapping the brain? So for me, it is really about what it is to be human. Uh, uh, meaning, uh, I think. The questions that I'm deeply interested in are what is so weird and unusual about humans, where we are able to dominate every part of the uh, 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 of the landscape uh, of, of the of the world, uh, and there's nobody 90% of us. Uh, uh, what I mean is, you know, when you learn about the fastest, maybe the cheetah, the fastest animal in the world, is an animal like 90% is faster, and then so on and so on and so on and you could probably, in a fairly smooth line, go from the cheetah to the turtle, 
uh, uh, just by gradations of speed. But it's hard to do that with humans. You, you, you see the gradation, but you get to somewhere around the great apes, and then all of a sudden, you go, it leaps. Uh, uh, now, maybe Douglas Adams was right, and the mice are the smartest, and, it, and there's a third level of experiment that I'm, I'm not aware of. But usually I, I say, well, it's, think about who does the experiments on who. We do the experiments on the animals, and they don't do the experiments on us. Do a first approximation. So there's something weird and unique about our brains. Uh, and I think, I sadly think, the thing, of course, that makes us unique is the thing that makes us vulnerable to the things that human brains are vulnerable to. Weird psychologies, uh, 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 psychiatric illnesses, uh, racism, as a particular un, you know, world view. I think these two things have to be linked somehow. Uh, the thing that makes us special and the thing that makes us weak. And the best thing, I, the best version of it I can tell is, is, is our development, is our childhood. The things that we were raised on when we were teenagers, or, 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 or maybe a little earlier, maybe a little later. But if we understood that period of our lives better, and I bet a lot of you would like to, to, to write better books, I think that would be the key to understanding what it means to be human. So it sounds weird, but I think I'd like to figure out how to, to map a brain so I can figure out what goes on in a teenager's home. That sounds like a lot of effort. But <laughs> Right, but I mean, um, yeah, and I mean, so, uh, you know, we talked briefly yesterday, and we were talking, for example, about that, um, that developmental uh, moment, which I actually talk to teens about sometimes, which is that where, um, you know, your brain as a teenager, it's still being hardwired. So, you know, whatever you learn then is hardwired. Well, I mean, I guess in a sense it always is, but I mean, especially then it is being constructed. And so therefore what we learn then um, has a presence the stuff that you learn later does not come out. So, you know, I always you know, use the example. I can remember books that I loved when I was 12 years old to the point where I could almost recite them. But if you ask me the plot of a book I finished literally two weeks ago, I can't remember it, even if I really enjoyed it. And there's a neurological reason for that. And I think, I think that, you know, one of the things we're lucky about is even if, um, from an uh, a, um, evolutionary point of view, the human is not supposed to survive as long as we do. I mean, it seems unlikely that we're really supposed to be around. We're supposed to be you know, uh, eaten by a glyptodont or something before then. Um, nonetheless, um, one, of the, one of the amazing things is that that, 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 that stage of creativity and, um, and fire and energy and, and you know, sort of development is still present and that the young can carry us forward to some extent and can prod the rest of us along because there's almost i feel a neurological feel to uh, perception when you are older that is to say you feel you can almost feel that sense of being too set in how the mind deals with certain facts you know what i mean I, like when you go I mean, up, uh, I, 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 no, no, please, please, please. I was just going to say, when you go on a trip to some place, really exotic. Yeah. So I actually spend, and many people know this, but I spend a lot of my time thinking about ways to collect evidence for this idea that human children uh, or teenagers have learning capacity that adults don't. And you would think there's a lot of literature on this, but there's so many confounds uh, uh, to like that. So no one has really activated Honestly, the closest, and, and I think it is, the difference is that children are used to, to encountering the, uh, the unexpected, because at some level, it's all unexpected to them, <laughs> you know, from the moment of birth on. Uh, uh, so, it's all, so they're better at it, but it's really hard to design a test around that. Uh, and so if people are interested, or somebody, please tell me, but the closest I've ever come is on YouTube, <laughs> where I learned a lot more things. There's somebody who's invented something called a reverse bicycle, uh, uh, which is that, you know, when you, when you go this way, it actually goes, the bicycle goes the opposite direction mm -hmm. that you would expect. So it seems like an obvious thing to figure out rationally uh, uh, and get on it and do it. Uh, and the guy details what it takes him to learn this reverse bicycle. It's the most ridiculous thing. You would think he, had a, he doesn't, a neurological problem. Uh, uh, and then he details his son, who I think is 15 or 16 or, or, or so, 
who learns it in you know 10 to 100 times faster. It's a completely new concept that no one is used to. Everyone is used to the exact opposite, how a bicycle works. And I think this is the closest I can come to imagine to do experience. And what is that? What is that capacity in a brain that says, I see this thing or I think of this thing that has never, you know, rarely ever been thought of, never been used, and I can accommodate it uh, in a way exactly like you were saying, Kevin. I can feel my ability to do that slip every day, <laughs> every, every day. I, I, I know I've already passed the reverse bicycle state, which I know. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, it's, it's when it comes to things like uh, like language acquisition, and you know that's so so obvious, yeah. But now, um, and you had said previously that one of the things you one of your dreams is to somehow um, reproduce in adults that kind of pliancy and, and fluency. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, I'd be great. I actually think it's impossible. Uh, <laughs> I know that most of you don't want to hear this. Uh, uh, but I actually think it's impossible. One of the things I'm curious about is, is it impossible? And, 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 and I'll just, if you, for two minutes, I'll, I'll give you how I think of the analogy. Uh, there are probably like two ways to build a statue. Uh, uh, so if we were uh, Michelangelo building David, we could get little pieces of alabaster and glue them together uh, and make a statue. Uh, uh, and, and then, or there's a second way, which is the real way. We get a piece of marble that's bigger than David and chip away everything that's not David, uh, uh, revealing uh, David. Now, the students sometimes ask me, well, what's the deal? Who cares? And I said, well, imagine that you made that statue for my parents. My parents are Hindus. Uh, and so they said, great statue. Could we have a few more arms? We like four arms or, or, or six arms. Uh, and in the first model, the constructivist model, you say, oh, that's no big deal. I get more pieces of marble together, and I can add two more uh, uh, arms. Uh, but in the second model, you're screwed. You can't actually make the statue with four arms because you've already pruned away the other arms, uh, uh, potentially, when it was a block of marble. You may add arms, but they will never be as strong uh, or as seamless as the arms that you pruned away. And so a fundamental question I have uh, uh, is, which is the model for how brains develop? Uh, is it in the beginning, every neuron, the number of connections grows, which is the first model? Or is it the pruning, where when you're born, every neuron is connected to every other neuron, and you prune those connections away? You physically. We don't know that right now. We don't know that yet. Uh, we don't know it definitively uh, because mapping connections in brains has been so hard, and it's gone back and forth, et cetera. But now, with us along with some other people are starting to collect data that it's really the pruning. Oh, okay. Huh. That's interesting because that, you, you wouldn't think that that would be the way that it would go, considering the kind of like, uh, you know, like cellular acceleration elsewhere in the body, you know? That's yeah, kind of cool. It, it's, uh, it, it's, yeah, and it is literally, we think, you know, it's, we, have to, we have to be careful because it fits so many of our stereotypes of getting old. Uh, uh, it is that, you, you know, the number of pathways, if you will, that a thought can go down the brain becomes limited because the number of connections between neurons uh, 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 is limited. And, and it, I hope, could be the physical basis for creativity. Why, why are children more creative? Well, because more parts of the brain are actually physically connected together uh, uh, than in a child. So that, that thought in there has more, can go to the color center or can go to the auditory center but, or can go to the, uh, you know, some other center. But in the brain, as we get older, those connections get fluid. So the number of places a thought can go, goes down over time, which means our creativity goes down uh, over time. So I'm not sure it's ever possible uh, to give it back to an adult but without somehow incurring some cost, uh, that, you know, where you act like a child or a teenager again. The two things might have to be linked in a way, but my suspicion is we'll never get it back. Well, that's super depressing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, um, but here, I, so, um, is there a way that um, that scientists who are talking about, I mean, you know, let's just say things like brain um, com computer interface, like wetware, hardware interface, that kind of thing, or uh, or AI expansion to the point where it is where it um, might reach a singularity? Are there um, are there there are sort of institutions in place that are to discuss the, the sort of um, 
you know, the, the end results of that, as opposed to simply thinking of it uh, on a project by project basis. No, I, I so I think there is, you know, there are things like uh, the open AI project and AI for good. Uh, uh, and I, I know there are people out there. I know there are people out there thinking about this, but I don't think there's any widespread effort uh, 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 to make it happen. Do you think that it was uh, significant that when you started to discuss that, your lights went out? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I was thinking of the same thing. We will not be discussing this. <laughs> the show is over, Bobby. <laughs> That's the, uh, yeah. The, the, the uh, media sphere is uh, moving in on you. <laughs> Which will happen at some point is I say that we want to collect a zettabyte of data. And, and I still have to restart like my computer every, you know, every time, just like everybody else. Or PowerPoint freezes, or the movie doesn't play like you know, I want wanted to exactly. And I remember every time I think, you're going to do this a trillion times more than you're doing right now, the computer barely works. So, uh, you know, some, I, some days I'm very optimistic, and some days I feel like I'll just be happy if PowerPoint works. <laughs> <laughs> right. But actually, you know, I do think that that's it. That's an important thing. Like, if you have some system that extended uh, human memory or human uh, or, or human, you know, capacity in any other way, what does it mean then when it when you get the blue screen? You know what I mean? Like, what does it mean when there's a failure of the technology? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, you know. Um, anyway, I mean, so I guess one of my questions is that, of course, instinctively, unlike the person. Um, Paul Castle wants me to be. Um, instinctively, I myself become uh, very, very tentative about this, only because I feel like I can see so much possibility for vast harm. Um, and yet, um, on the other hand, I, then I have to say to myself somewhat depressively, the thing is that um, humans have, we've never been a particularly benign species. Why is it that I fear being supplanted by something else? Should I perhaps right. give in and say, look, we, you know, we are a particular evolutionary, um, you know, uh, uh, I mean, we, we sort of have started to spread virally. Um, why not give something else a chance? Time for the AI, time for the insect overlord, you know? Uh, um, yes. Yeah. Yes. And by the way, if they're recording this, you know, and they can go through all the video quite quickly, we'll be on the record saying we're on their side to start. So I think this is a great opportunity to oh, tell everybody gosh. that we're there. <laughs> I just want to tell the insect overlords to um, that my, um, if you can dig up my books, um, they still, I'm sure, can be purchased in your era, um, and they're much better in hardcover. That's right. <laughs> well. All the yeah, yeah, yeah. first of all. Um, I love listening to your questions for each other, uh, but we've got a lot of people who might also want to ask you questions. So uh, let's let's do let's move to the Q and A. We'll open the Q and A back up, and we'll see what this is spurring in some of the other people. And as uh, your questions are coming in from the audience, um, so where's the open question? There we go. <laughs> um, so, Bobby, what do you think um, you'd like to see science fiction explore? And Tobin, what do you think you'd like to see science explore? Where Where do you want things to head in the future? Man, I have tons of my own stories that I want to pitch to Tobin later on. Uh, so I, I, I think that's where science fiction should go. They should publish the, our stories to be very soon, I think. Uh, but, but, uh, but, but broadly, you know, I don't ever have a view for where science fiction goes. I'm always amazed, actually. Uh, I just, uh, uh, you know, because I sometimes don't get to read as much as I want, so I search the latest sci-fi stories, like once uh, maybe a year or every six months. I'm constantly amazed by the ideas that are developed. I'm constantly amazed by how much sci-fi I haven't read. Uh, 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 just, I think, um, a few years ago, I read uh, The Three-Body Problem, which is uh, uh, the, 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 the Chinese. 
and I didn't know it existed. I didn't, you know, it was shocking to me that there was this entire world of, of Chinese sci-fi that I had knew nothing about. I just and he's, a, he's an author many. whose whose science fiction work has actually right. been spurred different action by the scientific community in China. So it's a it's a great uh, it's a great example. Huh. So I I have one more sci-fi story. Now any particular avenue I'll let go of but I mean, I do wish, of course, that there was some way to kind of rejuvenate the freshness of of our neural experience. Um, and I, but you know, right now there are still ways we can do that by taking ourselves to settings that we are unfamiliar with, by forcing ourselves to experience things that are totally new that are going to create new neural connections. You know, there, it's not a mistake that when you go on a vacation, you oftentimes can remember the day in like 10 minute increments. Like, oh, that's what happened then, and then we got a drink, and then we went to the city, and then, you know, whereas when you, you know, I mean, I can't tell you what I did any day last week, because there's nothing sufficiently new about it. So anyway, there are ways we can do that, but uh, like I would be, I would love it if there is a way to feel that freshness. Like the first time you have an idea when you're a teenager, and you've never had that idea before. Isn't that incredible? I know. <laughs> um, so one of the questions uh, from the audience is, is there a preferred brain to map, young, old? Uh, what do you look at when you're mapping the brain? Uh, so uh, first, I think the preferred brain question is an excellent and obviously you know, controversial and loaded question. Ultimately, what we want is lots of brains mapped so we can do math and statistics and, uh, 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 and do comparison. I really don't care which one gets mapped first. Just by uh, just by uh, size, you know, since baby brains are smaller, so it takes less time to map them than adult brains. So we'll probably do something along that vein, but we don't have any preference one way or the other. And, and was there a second part to it? I'm sorry. And oh, what we look at is very similar to what I showed you, except at scale, where we look at, at how every neuron, uh, if you remember, I think they were called E, F, and G. There was only four of them. Uh, 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 in that picture, but in the brain of a human, there's a hundred billion in a mouse, which is what we're working on, there's a hundred million. So we'd like to detail uh, like a map, like a road map, actually, between uh, cities, uh, 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 what the connections and pathways are between every neuron. Okay, and we have another question. Uh, Bobby and Tobin, do you see brain plasticity as a way to create or recreate a new way of thinking? How can brain plasticity make us more creative? So I'm, yeah, I'll let uh, Tobin in. I, I think my my answer is going to, by necessity, be analog because I do not know the science. And, and I would just say that you know, sort of reiterate what I said a minute ago, which is I think you can experience that plasticity in an almost physical way by taking yourself to places you have not been, by forcing yourself into situations you haven't. Experienced. I personally, for example, find that my writing, um, and I know that many of you out there are writers, even if I am not writing about the place I'm going to or anything having to do with it, you know, even if I'm, you know, going to, I don't know, like France or Nepal or something, but writing about the town I live in here, um, it actually really stimulates things because you're constantly dealing with difference. You're constantly learning things. You know, when I tried, when I, I did a book on, um, a nonfiction book on, on Russia during the Second World War. And so, um, you know, walking around there, I, I had just learned Cyrillic um, and only the very rudiments of, of Russian, of tourist Russian. Well, it was so funny because, like, I, it, it took me back to the experience of learning to read because, once again, I'm actually sounding out letters that I can only barely recognize. Because so, like the alphabet is different. So then it was always funny because then, of course, it would always turn out to be like pizza bar, um, you know, or sushi house, you know, that kind of thing. But anyway, yeah. Um, so, um, but it was so funny to be reading these words again, like I hadn't read since I was a six year old. And that kind of thing stimulates thought, even if it's not connected. It's, it's something that, you know, I was thinking of doing uh, uh, the, the video. Um, I, 
One interesting thing about our brains, I just want to see if we can parse this idea of creativity. Is I can almost come up any crazy scenario idea that I have right now. I can communicate it to you. Uh, any combination uh, of stimuli, sensory, smell, et cetera. And you're just like, okay, I get that. Uh, it's in my head now. I got it. Uh, you know, how about an onion with ears? Sure, no problem. I can imagine that. Uh, 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 we've never thought about it. I've never heard about it. Ears and onions often have never been associated uh, uh, in my brain. So any word that I, any set of words that I can uh, come up with, you can associate and immediately say, yeah, I can understand that. So I don't. I'm not sure if that's creativity because that doesn't feel like what COVID is describing to me. Uh, uh, just saying an onion with ears. Oh, that's cool. I get it. But there's something different about when I figured out how calculus works, or uh, uh, or uh, or you know, in another sense, why that girl cried at the dance uh, uh, when we went that night. Uh, uh, both insight into me and insight into the world uh, seem somehow different in these creative moments than any two any two ideas that I have to visualize or, or think about. I, I don't know which one is brain plasticity and which one is not, but I have no idea where that comes. I'd love to know it. it. Maybe if we can map the entire brain and every neuron, it has to be there somewhere. Well, and I think the creativity is combinatorial, right? I mean, it is combinatorial, but it's it's a kind of an explosive combination. It's unexpected. But then also, I think the other thing about it, that to use your example, is that it has to do with a lot of follow through, which I think also connects with what Paul was saying. It has to do with sure an onion with ears itself. It may not be interesting, but if you take that idea and then actually build that out, um, for example, uh, the girl at the dance was crying because that was her date. Um, then suddenly you get closer to, um, to um, you know, an actual sort of like, yeah, actual creativity is when there's follow through so that the initial idea moves into something that's sustained and that draws more into its ambit, into its orbit. Huh. I totally agree. All right, we have another question. Uh, Bobby, I really liked your use of the JFK quote in your presentation. Um, in a time where uh, science is being questioned um, or not supported, uh, where can this generation find direction in STEAM? And Tobin, what do you think about the political structure affecting the use of science? So. Uh, you know, I would much prefer to have more emphasis on science currently. I would have much prefer more dialogue on science. But I, one thing that I find interesting, again, uh, I might be idealizing what it's like to be kids. Uh, kids are going to figure out how to be scientists, whether the adults are actively supporting it or not. We spoke a little bit yesterday uh, when we were prepping for this, but there are more uh, paleontologists working now than in the history of the world. Uh, and you can trace that event, the, the fact that we have more paleontologists now, uh, to the release of Jurassic Park, because that was 20 some, 30 some uh, years ago. And those kids now are adults that are paleontologists. Uh, so they found science in that book, in that movie, uh, uh, and how I did it, it didn't, when I became interested in the brain, I didn't really care what the president at the time thought about science, uh, uh, one way, uh, 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 or the other. So I think you can find it. That being said, I still I think there's a lot more improvement we could have in our structures uh, uh, for, for, for promoting uh, uh, science. But I think Tobin probably has more to say about that than I do. Well, I mean, I feel like um, yeah, I I, um, I would want to to broaden this discussion from STEM to basically to just learning in general. Um, you know, there has always been a um, an American strand of anti-intellectualism, um, that has always been part of the the political culture of this country since the European invasion, you know, in the 17th century. And um, I feel like, at the same time, um, you know, right now is is a somewhat bleak moment because it feels to me like the educational reforms of the um, of the early 2000s, which were frankly, in many cases, bipartisan, um, were um, were reasonably disastrous and have actually 
removed so much excitement from teaching. They've removed the moments where a teacher can be passionate about something um, themselves and, and can convey the passion for knowledge to their students. I mean, I have to admit that, yes, I absolutely think uh, STEM needs to be the integral part of that, but I also feel like the humanities, history in particular, um, and, and language study, even if it's not a literary language, these things like are central to, the, to our survival as a civilization. And it's weird to me that there are, that, that it feels to me that the system is in such disrepair um, for a lot of reasons that unfortunately are, you know, not, they're too complicated to get into, but they have to do with, with also, um, you know, larger systemic issues with our politics, with the, uh, with the way that the, that the sort of, you know, the, that there is an American oligarchy now that to some extent calls the shots. Um, even with things like educational policy. So anyway, um, I think that if there are teachers in the audience, I'm sure that they would have more to say about this um, than us. You know, but I think that, it, that it's a real danger. We need to think of ourselves not simply as a culture, but as a civilization. And it, uh, when we think in the past of great civilizations, they are civilizations that have, that have performed great scientific deeds, and at the same time, there's been that ferment. In fact, I suspect working somewhat on the same model as, as the individual brain is in a sense the, the, the societal uh, brain, the, the network of, as it were, individual human neurons that are in a foment at particular times and that produce connections between things that are not later gonna be connected. You know what I mean? And that's what we want instead of this sort of this culture of uh, a, a kind of stasis and, and fear and misery, which I think, unfortunately, is what our schools are, have rapidly become over the last couple of decades. Yeah, that's truly depressing, Joe, and that's actually a new idea for me. The idea that if you could imagine the human brain, not in that sense, but human's brain, I guess, brain a brain made of humans, and as that society ages, the connections get lost between those humans, the way as a brain ages, the connections between the neurons get lost. And then that society can never feel that kind of joy it had as a young society uh, 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 coming up with ideas or discovering ideas, just like the way I say that an old brain can never really recapture that idea of what it was uh, 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 to be a young brain and experience something uh, for the first time. You're probably right, that analogy is probably right, that the connections in older societies grow stale like the connections in older brains. Well, speaking of older brains, <laughs> um, I have another question um, about the idea of uploading your consciousness. Is this something that people are working towards? Is this something that rich people will have in five years, ten years, like in the show Upload? Um, what's, what's possible? I think none of it is possible uh, uh, right now. Uh, uh, I think none of it is even close to possible, uh, just to be fair. Uh, uh, I think when it happens, it's unlikely to require something less than the whole body to do it. I, I don't, I'm not, it's not clear to me that if you put a brain, just the brain, uh, uh, inside a computer, especially an adult brain, uh, because that brain has been designed for the particular sense organs that you have. If you have a, if you were born with a slight defect in your cornea, your brain has accommodated that. If your right ear lobe is slightly larger than your left ear lobe, so sound is slightly different among your two ears, your brain has accommodated that. You don't know, we don't feel it now because it's seamless. But then the idea that we get this brain that's been perfectly tightly integrated to my body and my senses and then put it in the computer in the back, I don't, I don't see how that works. I don't see why that brain doesn't just go cuckoo bananas. Uh, you know, because I'm used to that. It would be like going blind, deaf, dumb, and you know everything else all at the exact same moment. You know, maybe you could have artificial. It won't be the actual sense organ. So I, I'm not. I, I'm not sure about it. Now, in the day that it ever does happen, yes, rich people will get it first. I assume, just like everything else that rich people get first, uh, 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 etc. I think. That's almost independent of whether that takes us a hundred years 
to get this to work or, 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 or 10 years to get it to work? Yeah, I think that's an interesting question for science fiction as well. If you have all these um, people, you know, you talk about the human brain as all of these different connections. You're, you might maintain those connections, but you're not getting those new ideas. You're not refreshing society in the same way. Um, what are your thoughts on transhumanism? I see humanity using our advances in cybernetics and genetics to push ourselves higher rather than allowing AI itself to head towards singularity. Uh, meaning, what, uh, do I think it's a good idea? Uh, uh, is that either one, I, I guess, any way you want to interpret it. I think of these things, and obviously I would defer to Tobin, I think of these, like, it's like thinking about the pie, I think, uh, uh, or, 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 or so. I don't think of them any particular way. I think of them maybe as inevitable, uh, maybe a, in a time scale uh, longer uh, uh, than now, but I, I think I, if I'm understanding it right, I think augmenting our brains uh, with computers and we do it already, but direct augmentation seems as inevitable as the glasses leading to sunglasses or uh, 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 I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I, I can see um, transhumanism being like, you know, it, I feel like it's interesting that um, science fiction in our lifetimes has shifted from being about sort of vehicles and externalities to being about uh, information um, and internalities. And, and you know what I mean? Like, uh, which also has to some extent followed the shift from utopian science fiction to dystopian science fiction as the making huh. Oh, and I do feel like, um, I mean, I would rather, um, I'd rather put my money on the human race because even if we are um, oftentimes a shitty species, a, uh, you know, we're the species I know. Um, so, um, you know, I mean, even if we are rapacious and greedy and therefore highly destructive to every other life form on the planet, somehow still it's hard for me not to vote for just because I am one of them. Um, I don't know that that's, I don't know though that that is reasonable. It, it doesn't sound reasonable, but it sounds right. <laughs> it doesn't sound like, uh, 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 sorry, I didn't mean to jump in. It doesn't sound, you know, on a prima facie defensible, right? Of course, <laughs> but I have a different version of it. I feel like humans are the funniest species I know. Uh, uh, so far, my cats are a little bit close, but it's never deliberate. Uh, uh, so I maintain that I will put my money on humans as long as they're the funniest species. I know. I, that it's not rational. You so, set a low bar, my friend. <laughs> no, I have it's true. It gets lower as I get older. <laughs> so okay, another question, and we're I know we're almost out of time. I just have a more questions in our queue here. Uh, if we knew the ways to build intelligence from scratch, shouldn't we just implement that technology on ourselves to make humans smarter instead of building a new robot species that can potentially extinct us? Uh, sure, I, I would say that yes. If we knew a way to make humans smarter, uh, uh, we should work on it. It just doesn't seem to be in the cards, uh, uh, meaning uh, uh, it, it obviously is the thing that uh, every many neuroscientists, many scientists, many engineers, many educators, many writers uh, uh, have worked on well before me, well after me, decades, etc. I don't feel like humans are fundamentally smarter now than they were 100 years ago or 200 years ago. Maybe we're better read. Uh, uh, maybe we have more access to data. Uh, but are we fundamentally smarter? I don't, it's hard for me to say. Oh, maybe we have better nutrition and with poverty uh, 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 reductions, the mean intelligence of human beings has uh, uh, shifted. But at the high level, you know, at the ideal level, at the genius level, uh, I'm not sure there's any difference. Uh, and in fact, I don't see, it's not like we had more Einstein's, at, you know, with all the technology and all the, uh, uh, so I'd love to figure it out, but as far as I could tell, it is very difficult. Uh, let me say another one. Um, 
particularly uh, going forward in the future. I don't even know what smarter means. Uh, uh, how would I make a human smarter? So if I was to say, if I wanted to make a human smarter than me today, I'd say, well, you know what? That guy better be a really good at reading books. He better be fast at reading books. Uh, you better have a long attention span, he or she. Uh, 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 better stay, better be able to be able to stay up at night. And that are the two Excellent to be memory. Right. Yeah. And does that have anything to do with what life is going to be like 30 years from now, uh, 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 40 years from now? Are those going to be the keys to success like they were 30, 40 years ago? I have no clue. And I doubt it, right? Uh, uh, my former postdoc mentor, when I had kids, said, Look, the best thing you can do, and I think this is true about trying to make humans smarter, is to just be benevolent and ignorant. Uh, you'll be surprised how quickly their lot, they will have their own lives, uh, and you won't really understand what's going on in their lives. Uh, uh, because it, humans do that, they can quickly do that uh, for anything. And what will happen in 2010, when you told me this, will be so different than 2000. It'll be different between what happened between 1940 and 1950. And it'll certainly be different between what happened in 200 BC versus 210 BC. 2000 versus 2010 or 2010 versus 2020, these differences seem to be growing uh, 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 between every 15, 20 years. So how would I even know what to predict how to be smart 20, 40 years from now? So I think we focus on robots because it's measurable uh, 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 and because it seems it seems impossible to get humans smarter. <laughs> it's terrible to say out loud, but I guess that's how I feel. <laughs> <laughs> Anything to add, Tobin? <laughs> <laughs> I'm holding. The, no, I'm holding out hope. I'm still holding out hope. I, uh, but I mean, I do also think that it. Um, yeah. I mean, it is interesting, though, the, the breakthroughs that have been made, for example, in, you know, reading, uh, the, I mean, you, you mentioned that these are very rudimentary, but, um, you know, like reading eng engrams, so that suddenly you can get a kind of a mushy idea of an image that someone is seeing um, recreated. Or, you know, there was that thing at MIT where they forced one person to play a video game uh, by stimulating his yeah. motor cortex or something, as the other guy could see yeah, the screen. Yes, I agree. In fact, I mean, I've seen versions that's pretty where they, uh, 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 they, they can connect a, um, a, 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 a monkey to a, a robotic arm that then uh, first locally, so that the robotic arm feeds directly through brain activity, feeds itself. Then over the internet, they can the monkey can direct that arm to feed another monkey uh, mm -hmm. uh, just by watching and by controlling its own brain activity. I think these are all fast, amazing things, actually. But at the end of the day, I don't know if that monkey is smarter for doing that, or we're any smarter for the fact that it was done. So, sorry, but I think it's because I think differently about, not differently, I'm not being clear about being smart. I think it's easy for humans to accumulate facts. We can, but your book perhaps uh, speaks to this too, Tobin. There's only a limit to which I can connect my brain to the internet, and at which point I become actually dumber with the collection of facts uh, 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 as opposed to smarter. Uh, what is that? I think that's right. I think that adding facts to humans doesn't make us smarter. Uh, adding more facts doesn't make us smarter faster. Uh, it is true that facts are required to be you know, smart and uh, et cetera, but it seems still hard for me to figure out what that means. I I'll stop because I'm clearly baffled. Um, okay, I have one more, one more question and then we will wrap up. Um, did you, do you think that you went into the professions you have because of the way your brains were wired from birth or that it was all of the, you know, influences on you? You know, I think this is the... Go ahead, Joe, please. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, because I uh, certainly there are things I can see in my biography that pushed me that way. But, you know, I mean, I, you know, I, as I'm sure, um, Bobby, as I'm sure you'll, you'll agree that, um, you know, the predispositions or some predispositions are there. Those predispositions may be vague, but they are, they become, I think, tremendously important also. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I, yeah. 
well, taking away actual not science. much that I could say, but this is a version of the nature versus uh, 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 maybe the nature versus nurture argument, which is this idea for are we born to it or are, are we built to it? Uh, you know, again, I, I would say people much smarter than me have addressed this question. It's not clear that extra technology helps us answer the question better than Plato did or Aristotle or, 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 or et cetera. So far, the fact that I can see a brain signature in a machine doesn't help me answer the nature versus nurture. Mapping the brains don't. I suspect the answer is nurture, uh, that the predispositions are there, but it's really the environment that shapes us. But I don't have enough evidence or data to, to, to suggest it. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, that's a fair way to say it. OK. For me. <laughs> Um, well, I could talk to you guys all night, but I know people have places to be. But I want to end with one last question, um, and this is for both of you. So what do you think is our best hope for the future? I know you're both interested in, you know, we've talked about uh, YA as being a place where people are learning and experiencing things for the first time, and we're looking at the way brains grow and thinking about other learning presences in the world. So, so what's the best hope for us going forward? Well, I mean, I honestly do feel like um, the, the fact that we, that we are so neurologically malleable, which also means that we're so behaviorally and I feel like um, a, a younger generation is actively aware of, and, and emotionally aware of the pressures that people in my parents' generation, for example, simply by and large cannot almost take in in, the, in, in an appropriate way. Um, I'm thinking of things like climate change. And, you know what I mean? Like, um, so those things, which there's almost a kind of a, almost biochemical barrier to them being fully realized by one generation. They become the facts that a new generation is built on. And so, you know, to build off what Bobby said in the last question, you start to get these developmental roots that were not possible for me when I was growing up in the 1980s. Um, so my hope, uh, you know, really is that we are producing a new generation um, who understands that the, the challenges that this species faces, and that this world faces, um, better than... Yeah, absolutely right. In fact, the only hope the and the only threat <laughs> has always been children and young people, uh, 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 meaning both. But the only hope we have, because our brains are too old to change and to, to incorporate this new information, is that children will do it and save us in the future. But we also know that as they become adults, they will they will take into that adult world what they learned in 2000, in 2020. And at some level, it will fail them in the world of 2050 or 2060, because it always has. Uh, 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 so so it, both things are true. The worst thing and the best thing that can happen to us will be our kids, just based on history. They will save us from these things, and then they will invent new troubles uh, for which their children hopefully will save them. Uh, one of these days, the adults are going to get us into so much trouble that the kids can't get us out of it. Uh, and it's like Dovid says, maybe we're approaching that moment uh, uh, soon, but I think that's how it fails. All right. Well, thank you so much for talking with us today, uh, Bobby Testori and M.T. Anderson. I also want to thank NIU STEAM and the Friends of the Library. And if you are watching this in the future, reconstructing this data, I just want to say once again, all hail our insect overlords. <laughs>